London, spring of 1765. A debate in Parliament over what seems to be a very small shift in colonial policy. Running the overseas provinces has become extremely expensive. Parliament announces that for the first time, the Americans will pay a small tax, not to their local legislatures, but directly to England. I think that's the first thing that one has to say, looking back on it, seeing now, as we must do, that this was the opening of something which was going to be very big and very important, is that nobody realized that at the time. Uh, the British government had a variety of bits of legislation in hand, dealing with a variety of problems, as governments do. This was one of them, a moderately prominent piece of, of legislative program of 1765, uh, tidying up various details of the administration of colonies. But it wasn't really a subject of vast interest. It was rather technical. It was extremely remote. If you had stopped the average man in the street and said, what do you think about the Stamp Act, my man? Uh, he would have said, what? It is called the Stamp Act because taxed items will have to carry a stamp paid for by the user. Test pressings are made and the new tax is set to go into effect in the fall. It takes six weeks by sailing ship for news of the tax to cross the ocean. When it arrives, the news creates a firestorm up and down the continent. For the colonial elite, the men who run the local legislatures, the Stamp Act is an outrage. It seems to confirm their worst suspicions that they are not respected in England, not worth even being consulted about this change in policy. George Washington is a delegate sitting in the Virginia legislature. The Stamp Act, imposed on the colonies by the Parliament of Great Britain, is an ill-judged measure. Parliament has no right to put its hands into our pockets without our consent. Even royal appointees like the highly regarded Thomas Hutchinson, Chief Justice of Massachusetts, are upset. You must not deprive the colonies of their right to make laws for themselves. Parliament should only make laws necessary for the empire as a whole. The larger meaning of their life was wrapped up in being, being Britons. They were proud not to be Dutch, not to be French, not to be Spanish colonists, but to be British colonists, and to have, for 150 years, tax themselves, govern themselves, behave just like independent Englishmen did although they were living in America. Now suddenly the Stamp Act implied that they were going to be governed, taxed by a parliament a long way away in which they had no representatives. Now the only people who were taxed without their consent in Britain were servants, people who didn't have any property, women, children, and so the Stamp Act seemed to Americans to reduce Americans to the same status as servants and women and all those dependent people who were uh, civilly emasculated. Uh, that is, they, 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 they didn't have any public, public role in their own governments. George Washington and other colonial leaders clearly see what will become of them unless they take action. A line should be drawn between Great Britain and the colonies, clearly establishing our rights. We must either assert our rights or submit and become tame and abject slaves, like the Negroes over whom we rule with such arbitrary sway. This tax is going to touch everyone. It's probably one of the dumbest political acts in the history of government. They tax dice and cards. So the rowdiest group of people there are in the world, sailors in port with nothing to do, are going to be angry. They tax legal documents, which means that lawyers, the most articulate and argumentative people in America, are up in arms also. If the stamp man tells you to kiss his ass, shall he get away with it and live? Don't let your courage cool, or a few bullies scare you. We've nothing to fear but slavery. 
Love your liberty and fight for it like men who know its value. Once lost, it will never, never be regained. The question in any case was never the immediate amount of taxation that the British were asking of the colonists. The question was whether the British had the right to do it at all. We are talking about people with enormous sensitivity to the dangers of power. If you conceded the right to Parliament to tax, and if there was no check on it, no limit, it could go on indefinitely. You could be bled white. The power to tax was the power to destroy. The colonial legislators send official petitions to the British Parliament, petitions that are completely ignored. The colonists had been saved from the specter of the French and Indians, uh, and there certainly were a lot of people in Britain who thought that they should be properly grateful for all this effort that had been expended on their behalf, mostly at the expense of the British taxpayer, uh, and that it wasn't unreasonable that they should pay a modest share, a great deal less than 100%, uh, of the cost of imperial defence in the future. The Stamp Act was a bad idea, but what could you do? That was the problem. Massachusetts came up with the answer, and it was a very good answer, a very simple answer. August 14, an effigy of the Stamp Man appears, hanging from what became Liberty Tree. Mobs collected, they bring coercion on him. In short, they force the Stamp Man, Andrew Oliver, to resign. Now, if you got one man to resign. If the Stamp Act stamps were not going to be distributed, well, the act couldn't be put into effect. The popular fury spreads. Thomas Hutchinson, Chief Justice of Massachusetts, is a passionate believer in law and order. Privately, he is against the stamp tax. Publicly, he makes it clear that he intends to enforce it. On August 26th, 1765, a mob assembles outside his house, one of the most elegant in Boston. Hutchinson and his family have just finished high tea. Hutchinson escapes with his life and little else. Hutchinson thought the Stamp Act was a very bad policy, but it wouldn't have crossed his mind that you therefore would resist it, that you'd resist it with violence. It was unthinkable. Everyone will suffer if the peace and order in the community are destroyed. I hope everyone will see how easily the people may be duped, inflamed, and carried away with madness. The intimidation of royal officials spreads to other colonies. Would-be stamp distributors are attacked. Stamp paper is seized when it arrives from England. Colonial leaders propose a joint boycott of British goods. A Philadelphia lawyer, John Dickinson, supports this idea. The taxes and duties imposed on us by Parliament must be instantly opposed. The only effective opposition is through the concerted efforts of all the provinces. By uniting, we stand. By dividing, we fall. In faraway London, Benjamin Franklin is surprised by the fervor of colonial reaction to the tax. Moreover, the crisis is interfering with important business he has before the government. He lobbies for the repeal of the Stamp Act. He reminds the parliamentary committee that the colonies are England's biggest market. Our buying your manufactured goods depends very much on our affection for you. Pride will induce Americans like me to wear our old clothes. And when we buy new clothes, they will be made by us. Franklin has powerful allies in Parliament, among them Edmund Burke. What are we doing with our constant insisting on taxing the Americans? 
We're not getting any revenue from them. Instead, we're pushing them to disorder and disobedience. You can wade up to your eyes in blood and you'll be back where you started. With no revenue. We make money from trade, not taxes. Let the Americans tax themselves. The pressure brings results. In February 1766, Parliament repeals the stamp tax. Throughout the 13 colonies, there is a sigh of relief. Americans look around the world and think how lucky they are to be the subjects of King George III. In a time when the French king regards himself as the direct representative of God on earth, when the Spanish king can tax his subjects without limit, and Catherine the Great of Russia deals with political opponents by cutting off their heads and displaying them at the end of a stake, the British king stands alone. The pride, the glory of Britain, the direct end of its constitution is political liberty. <laughs> 